Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis. We just finished talking about the neurophysiology of graded potential. Now we're going to move forward and we're going to talk about what happens from the axon hillock to the axon. And we're going to call this the action potential. A quick review. We talked about how we can divide the activity of the neuron into a graded potential, an action potential, and synaptic transmission. The graded potential, which we just discussed, occurs in the dendrites and the axon. The action potential occurs from the axon hillock, and it travels down the axon until it reaches the, the axon terminals, and this is where synaptic transmission occurs. So, now that we've talked about the graded potential, we're going to move forward. And I want you to remember that I liken the activity of a neuron to this metaphor of a soccer ball next to some dominoes next to a, a small ball. I said that the dominoes are kind of like the action potential. And whenever we inflate the soccer ball, it bumps the dominoes. The soccer ball is kind of like the cell body and dendrites and the, and the idea that if we pump it up, it's actually going to bump those dominoes. Now in a neuron, the pressure is an air pressure. It's actually electrostatic pressure. And whenever it, it decreases enough, it actually will initiate this, this domino effect. And then the domino effect, which is akin to the action potential, um, eventually bumps the ball at the end, which is akin to a neurotransmitter that falls off of the desk, which is a metaphor for a neurotransmitter being released into the synapse. So now that we've talked about the graded potential, we're going to move forward and talk about the action potential. The action potential is a rapid electrical signal that travels along the axon of a neuron, like dominoes. Action potentials are brief, but large changes in membrane potential. They originate in the axon hillock, as I mentioned before, and they're propagated along the axon. These patterns of action potential can carry information to presynaptic membranes, which then release neurotransmitters into the synapse. Now, if the membrane reaches the threshold of about negative 40 millivolts, it triggers an action potential, and this uh, action potential begins at the axon hillock, which you can see right here, this cone-shaped area. So the membrane potential reverses whenever this happens, and the inside of the cell becomes positive. You probably recall this diagram that I was using before when we were talking about the graded potential, and um, we talked about the fact that the charge of the intracellular space is constantly going up and down and up and down, depolarizing. And then if it depolarizes to negative 40 millivolts, that's when we're going to see this action potential. So we're no longer talking about the graded potential. Now we're going to be talking about the action potential. And instead of having a bunch of grades here on this side, of the imaginary line, we have a domino representing the fact that this is a self-propagating, unidirectional um, um, flow of energy. The action potential is not going to occur in the cell body and the dendrites. It's actually going to occur in the axon hillock and it's going to travel down the axon all the way to the axon terminals. So that's the reason we have this line here, because the action potential actually occurs on this side of the line. As you might recall, whenever, when we look at a microscopic level at the distribution of molecules inside and outside of the neuron, with the bottom being the inside, Inside has more protein, which gives it a negative charge compared to the extracellular area. 
On the outside, we have more sodium. In the intracellular space, we have more of this potassium, which is going to be these, these orange triangles. So, as you may recall, ions have been entering the dendrites, and they've been causing these graded potentials that we saw in the earlier slide that depolarize and hyperpolarize dendrites as well as the cell bodies. If the overall sum of excitatory postsynaptic potentials, which we're going to abbreviate EPSPs, and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, which we'll abbreviate as IPSPs, it can de depolarize the cell at the axon hillock and an action potential will occur. Temporal summation refers to the summing of these potentials that arrive at the axon hillock at different times. The closer together in time they arrive, the greater the summation and the possibility of an action potential. Another form of summation, of summation is spatial summation. It's the summing of potentials that come from different parts of the cell. If the overall sum of excitatory postsynaptic potentials and, and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials can depolarize the cell at the axon hillock, an action potential will occur. Now, neurons calculate the overall postsynaptic input and initiate an action potential if depolarization exceeds thre threshold uh, and that reaches the axon hillock. Starting at the axon hillock, the cell membrane is also studded with these structures. These proteins here are called voltage-gated ion channels. They're a type of gated ion channel, and as you recall, gated ion channels open and close in response to voltage changes, chemical or mechanical action. Now, the voltage-gated sodium channels are unique channels which open in response to the initial depolarization, which is when the membrane potential is negative 40 millivolts. So if we look down here, we see the charge of the intracellular space. This neuron's at rest because the intracellular space is negative 60 millivolts. However, due to depolarizing ions that are being let in by the receptors in the dendrites, we can see that the neuron is becoming depolarized. And here we're in a part of the axon hillock, so it's now negative 53 millivolts, negative 50 millivolts, the darker red that the intracellular space below becomes, the more depolarized we can say the intracellular space inside this axon hillock is. And if we reach negative 40 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channel will actually open. So what do you think is going to happen now that this channel is opened up? Well, if we think back to the distribution of sodium and potassium, um, we know that there's a high concentration of sodium in the extracellular space. Um, so at negative 40 millivolts, these voltage-gated sodium channels open. It, when the intracellular space depolarizes from its uh, negative 60 millivolt resting potential and reaches negative 40 millivolts. And what ends up happening is, the sodium is drawn quickly into the intracellular space. Well, why would it be drawn in? What would make it want to go into the intracellular space? Well, two things. The first one is there's a low concentration of it, so it's going to travel, it's going to diffuse into an area of lower concentration, being the intracellular space. Other reason is because the charge of the intracellular space is negative where sodium is positively charged. And as you know, positively charged ions, cations, are going to be attracted to negatively charged places. So as you can see, the influx of sodium continues until the membrane potential reaches the sodium equilibrium of positive 30 millivolts. Once it reaches positive 30 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channel closes. So now there's an abundance of sodium as well as potassium, which has actually caused a 
reverse of the polarity of the intercellular space. If you look up here, you might have noticed this is actually the charge of the intracellular space. Our y-axis is the voltage meter, but the x-axis is time. And as you can see, this is a resting potential here. If we look at this, what just happened is this is a neuron at rest. It's actually going to fluctuate a little bit. There's going to be depolarization and hyperpolarization. But when it gets to this point, you can see there's some dramatic depolarization. And once we hit threshold of negative 40 millivolts, that causes that voltage-gated sodium channel to open, which you just saw. And this rapid influx of sodium, which is caused by the diffusion as well as electrostatic pressure, it causes the, the charge of the intracellular space to actually reach positive 40 millivolts, at which time the voltage-gated sodium channel closes. No more sodium can come in. Well, what's going to happen then? This time can also be referred to as the absolute refractory period, because at this time we can't initiate another action potential, because there's already one in progress. So the extracellular space um, is where the sodium has left, and there's a low concentration of sodium and potassium, leaving the extracellular space 40 millivolts more negatively charged than the intracellular space. And the intracellular space has lots of sodium, um, which raises electrostatic pressure of the intracellular space, which is already saturated with sodium. So it actually, sodium as well as potassium, so the intracellular space is positively charged. So at that time, and I want to introduce our next voltage-gated channel, the voltage-gated potassium channel. So we have talked, when we talked about the graded potential, we talked about the potassium channel and the sodium-potassium pump. Now for the action potential, we're going to talk about the voltage-gated sodium channel, which we've talked about, the voltage-gated potassium channel, and then finally we're going to end by talking about the sodium-potassium pump as well. So um, sometimes it's helpful to use the acronym PSVVC. Uh, that's an acronym for the different pumps and channels that we use to understand what happens in a neuron. So this is our second voltage-gated channel, the voltage-gated potassium channel. They're unique channels which open when the membrane potential reaches positive 40 millivolts. When the voltage-gated potassium channel opens, potassium quickly exits the neuron for two reasons. Any thoughts on what those two reasons are going to be? Two specific reasons, as we discussed before, are going to be electrostatic pressure, which is going to push the, the potassium out, because at this point, the intracellular space is positively charged. The other's diffusion. Keep in mind, the extracellular space has hardly any potassium. So the potassium wants to go to an area of lower density because diffusion causes ions to flow from areas of high to low concentration down their concentration gradient. So voltage-gated potassium channels open when the intracellular space reaches positive 40 millivolts. And down here, you can actually see what the charge is going to be. Um, up here, we're going to see where this is at um, if we plot it on a Cartesian coordinate system. So the positive charge of the interior of the neuron is so high and the concentration of potassium in the intracellular space so strong that potassium, these, these orange triangles, are actually moving out. And they're moving out quickly, as we can see the charge of the intracellular space is also dropping as all these cations are squeezed out. And you can see that the color of the intracellular space is becoming less red. And that's because to reflect the fact that there is actually um, going to be a decrease 
of the charge of the intracellular space. And as we can see, all that potassium has left. So at this point, the charge is back down to the resting potential. And the voltage-gated potassium channel closes when the intracellular space reaches negative 40 millivolts. So once the potassium is mostly concentrated in the extracellular space and the sodium in the intracellular space, the sodium-potassium pump goes back to work. This is going to be the next step. You probably remember the sodium-potassium pump. Um, it pushes out three sodiums for every two potassiums that it draws in. Um, Again, it pumps three sodium ions out for every two potassium ions pumped in. And what it's going to do, the sodium-potassium pump, it pushes the sodium out of the neuron and draws the potassium into the neuron, which is not going to affect the charge of the intracellular space all that much. However, the distribution of the ions is going to be much different. It's going to be much more like it was before. So at this point, we finish the action potential. And a few closing thoughts I want to point out. First, the all or none property of the action potentials. The neuron fires at full amplitude or it doesn't fire at all. It's not graded. It's analog. Um, this is different from the graded local potentials which are graded and which can be of various strengths. I also want to remind you it's the voltage-gated sodium channels are the unique channels which open in response to the initial depolarization, which is when the membrane potential is negative 40 millivolts. The influx of sodium continues until the membrane potential reaches the sodium. Um, don't do this. Don't put this, this particular slide in. Okay, so one more time, I'm going to go through the stages of the graded and the action potential. So this is the resting potential. There are slight fluctuations, hyperpolarization, depolarization, more hyperpolarization. These are graded responses, but at some point when the depolarization actually gets to negative 40 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channels open. And as a result, there's an influx of positively charged sodium. Once the influx causes the charge of the intracellular space, the membrane potential, to reach 40 millivolts, the voltage-gated sodium channels are deactivated. They close but voltage-gated potassium channels open. At that time, potassium wants out of the neuron. The neuron's now positively charged, which pushes it out because potassium's positively charged as well. There's also a very low density of potassium in the extracellular space, so it's going to travel to areas of lower density, something that we're going to call diffusion. So those two forces together squeeze the potassium out of the intracellular space very quickly. And then when it reaches negative 40 millivolts, the voltage-gated potassium channels are going to close. And because of their slow closing, there's actually going to be a little additional dip here that we're going to refer to as the relative refractory period. Um, so here's the diagram that we used again, where we talked about the um, graded potential. And here, the graded potential is going to be everything to the left of this line. As you can see, there's going to be depolarization and hyperpolarization, depolarization, hyperpolarization, and uh, depolarization. Um, this is being caused, again, by these different neurotransmitters that are actually hitting the receptors. And we're going to talk about those in the next presentation. But whenever they actually hit these receptors, it causes little tiny ions to move, and they travel 
in waves. They travel down. And this is what we're calling this. These waves are what we call the graded potential that travels. Now, if they sum up in time and they have similar charges, in this case positive charges, it's going to cause this depolarization over time. And then whenever we finally depolarize the resting neuron to negative 40 millivolts, these voltage-gated sodium channels are going to open. There's going to be an influx of sodium. And whenever the intracellular space reaches um, membrane potential of 40 millivolts positive, then the voltage-gated sodium channels are going to close. The pota voltage-gated potassium channels will open. The potassium is then driven out of the, the intracellular space by diffusion as well as electrostatic pressure. At neg negative 40 millivolts, we're going to see the voltage-gated um, potassium channels close. And afterward, it's going to be relatively um, difficult for the neuron to fire again. We call this the relative refractory period. Um, so here you have the diagram missing the different labels, but I'd like you to look at it and see how many of those you would be able to um, recognize and label on your own. So the refractory period is when only some stimuli can produce an action potential. The refractory phase um, the absolute refractory phase is when no action potentials are produced, but the relative refractory phase is when only strong stimulation can produce an action potential. So um, the action potentials are regenerated along the axon. Um, each adjacent section is depolarized, and a new action potential occurs. And the action potentials travel in one direction because of the refractory state of the membrane after a depolarization. I'd like to mention that we have myelin wrapping the axon. And there are two reasons for that. First, it increases the magnitude of the energy in the action potential. Also, it increases the speed as well. The nodes of Ranvier, as you recall, are these small gaps in the insulating myelin sheet. Um, whenever the axon is covered by the myelin, in that area you can't actually have any active channels. And what ends up happening as a result is the action potential sort of jumps from one node of Ranvier to another. And this, in the end, actually ends up increasing the overall speed of the action potential. This is something we call saldatory conduction. The axon potential travels inside the axon, and it jumps from node to node in a, in a skipping motion that's actually quicker than if there was no myelin, which isn't surprising, because if we look at demyelinating disorders, uh, many of them actually cause the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, to be slower. And this is because we don't have the saltatory conduction. So here's a study guide for you. Feel free to look through and ask yourself some of these questions. I want to thank you. And next, we're going to talk about what happens at the synapse whenever the neurotransmitter is released.